What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to the first ever FNAF Theory Review. That's right, today we are beginning a new series where I am going to be reacting to some of your FNAF theories. Now, of course, this is the first one, so I have chosen three videos to react to today, and maybe in the future you guys can suggest videos for me to react to, or you can upload your own videos and send them to me. Either way, I think this is gonna be a really cool series because we get to kind of take a, a, a bigger glance into the community and maybe I can shine some light on some smaller theorists um, and, and some smaller theories and, and stuff like that. And I think it would be really cool. We are going to be reacting to three videos today. And the first one is by ID from the channel ID's Fantasy. Uh, and I have already seen this. I actually have already seen this. It's about Candy Cadet. And I think it's it, it deserves a lot more popularity because I, I think this is a really good theory. And I, I think people kind of overlook Candy Cadet and say it's all just the same story. But ID is going to go in depth into why she thinks it is actually three different stories. Let's get straight into it and I'll discuss my thoughts as we go. It's pretty easy to see how these stories share some common factors. All the stories have five things and stuff being put together and as such, the theory I usually see is that these stories are different tellings of the same event. All being evidence that the five children that William killed during the missing children's incident or MCI were combined into Molten Freddy with each of the stories being either William's or different people's perspectives of the five things becoming one. So the thing I will say straight up is kind of the thing that you've got to think about while FNAF theorizing is is kind of what was Scott's intention? What was Scott trying to tell us? And what kind of clues are there to guide us along that kind of path? And that's something that I think we have to think about as well with kind of like the recent books. I think a lot of people are going way off track in saying very, like, very deep things that I don't think even Scott thought of. I, I don't think Scott even th would have thought of. Uh, while creating the books, and it's kind of like he's leaving us a trail of breadcrumbs. Where is he taking us? And I think with Candy Cadet, Candy Cadet very, very clearly is saying five things going into one. The interpretation that ID is, is going to be pointing out here is very, very compelling. I think the main question that I have off the bat of, off the back of it is sort of was that Scott's intention or was this Scott or was it Scott's intention to kind of tie three different stories together and to say five one and I know that there are problems with that but there there are themes of five going into one in each of these stories so I, I do think that might have been Scott's intent but let's continue because I do think this is very compelling storytelling and I do think that ID does have a point here. However, while I do see the reasoning for this, there's one pretty major detail that signals to me that okay. this isn't the case. Namely, the fact that not all of the stories are about five things becoming one. Yes In and no. In the story about the five kittens, only one kitten right. is eaten by the snake, and after five nights is put back together. In the story itself, there's no mention of other kittens being eaten, and only one kitten is said to be put in the box. And given fully grown snakes only eat once a <laughs> week, there's no reason to assume I love that, that five piece of were evidence. eaten over the course of each of the nights. I love that Especially you used that. Story says that the boy thought that choosing one kitten to feed the snake might satisfy it. The only place I've seen that does say five kittens were eaten is the ultimate guide. And given it says that sister location takes place at Circus Baby's Pizza World instead of entertainment and rentals, yeah, and that ultimate we don't know what event iffy, can have three so is 30 years after, only to a couple pages later say Phone Dude says it's 30 years after the closing of Freddy's, which Phone Dude never says, Pop it's off. one of Scrap Baby's lines and Pizzeria Simulator wrong, and a whole bunch of other things I don't have time to go over, I would not rely on it for accurate information. Additionally, while I can see why people think that William is the one the stories are about, none of the main characters of the stories really fit William and his motivations uh, no, I, as well I, I, as other I, I characters agree with do. That. For those who watched my video on Sister Location's timeline placement, you may remember I mentioned what characters I think these stories are about. But as some had questions about my assignments, <laughs> and they probably do seem strange without context, I remember Matt Pat. And explain yeah, I remember Matt Pat was like, really? Example, I, think I don't key believe story that. Is pretty clearly about Charlie Emily and the missing okay. children. After all, the story stars a young woman sealed in a room and five trapped yeah. children, which sounds puppet. rather reminiscent of Charlie, whose soul was sealed in the puppet, and the five victims of the missing children incident, who were similarly trapped in the and, and I really, really. Really like that connection because it is five kids trapped in rooms but I, I like how it, it uses kind of the trapped aspect of it because the children's souls are trapped in the animatronics right 
the children's souls are trapped in the animatronics. And so it, it does have that sort of parallel. And, and I think this is very good storytelling from Scott Cawthon in that this is two different stories or no, this is the same story in two different lights, you know, on two different perspectives. So quite like that. Meanwhile, in the Give Gifts Give Life minigame in FNAF 2, Charlie as the puppet tries to help the five kids William killed, but her attempts to give them life leave them haunting animatronic vessels for decades, unable to move on until a happiest day involving the entire group can take place as their fates are bound together, just like the keys to the kids in the story's freedom. What's cool is that by looking at this story through the right. lens of it being Charlie yeah. trying to save the kids, it gives some extra insight that we wouldn't have gotten from just the minigame in FNAF 2. The young woman in the story had the opportunity to save one child along with herself, but in her attempts to save all of them left them all trapped. This could mean that Charlie could have saved one of the missing children, as Remnant doesn't just anchor souls to the realm of the living, but it can also heal, as shown by the Tales from the Pizzaplex story Frailty, where a girl uses Remnant to heal people who would otherwise die. Hold However, on. because Charlie tried to save all of them, she split her power between the whole group, yeah. keeping them anchored to the realm of the living, but not fully alive either. Maybe the end of the Give Gifts Give Life minigame, where she gives the kids the animatronic masks, isn't the only important part, as it could be that the gifts were Charlie's attempt to save them all, but when that didn't work, she gave them a way to live through the animatronics. But hey, that's or, just a theory, and it doesn't change- Or, hear me out, it could be something to do with Happiest Day. Maybe, 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 Charlie was like, Charlie was powerful enough to, to give one of the children their happiest day, to free one of the children, and to be free herself, I guess. Um, and so maybe she had that power all along, but she didn't want to do that because there were multiple children. She's not just going to choose one and be like, okay, here you go. Here's your happiest day. See you later, suckers. She's going to want to save all of the children. Uh, and, and that is that is her character. That is Charlie's character holding others in her arms. Uh, I forgot what the quote was in FNAF 6, but Henry Henry talks about that. Um, and so I, I, I do think this is a good connection. And I, and I think, at least for this story, it makes sense. It makes sense. I think we'll get on to the other two now. Um, but yeah. As for the kitten story, I think the boy in this story is a solid parallel to Michael Afton as of sister location. While that may sound strange, hear me out. The boy in the story has a snake that is specifically mentioned to be the color red, just like a certain Funtime animatronic, that kills one kitten at random just as Circus Baby killed one child. There are a lot of aspects of the story that make me think it's Michael. The story specifically says that it's after five nights that the boy feels regret and puts the kitten back together. The fact that it calls out the five nights is especially interesting to me since Mike is the one who spent five nights at Circus Babies and was the one to do the action of putting his sister back together according to his monologue in okay, Sister Okay, I... Oh, actually... Yeah, okay, I, I sort of like that. I sort of like that. Um, I like the Mike part of it. I, I think Michael does fit. You are right. It does say after five nights. That That is, I think that's the big five part in this story. It's like five nights. Like this is very clearly pointing us to Michael Afton. The only thing I'm not too sure on is you said the snake parallels baby, right? Because the snake is called out to be specifically red. I'm I, I'm gonna say that's a bit of a stretch. I'm gonna say that's a bit of a stretch. And yes, what else could it be? I don't know. But I, I think I think that is a little bit of a stretch. It's a hard one, right? Because it, as you, you're right, it, it doesn't really seem to to fit in with with the rest of the stories. Like it seems to be an odd one out, I feel like. Um, so I don't know. It's it's a strange one. With the kitten being put back in the box that the four other kittens were in, likely representing Elizabeth combining with the four other Funtime animatronics to create Ennard. Additionally, the fact that the term boy that is does used make in the some sort of story, sense. implying a child, makes it pretty clear to me that the character this story is meant to represent is the younger of the two Afton men. So if the key story is about Charlie and the kitten story is about Michael, that just leaves the story about the man and the orphans. This is the story I think connects the best to the usual fandom interpretation of connections to Molten Freddy, though not in the way you might think. 
To me, this story seems to be about Henry Emily in the lead up to Pizzeria Simulator. The man in the story brought the orphans toys and gladness, while Henry ran a restaurant and built robots to entertain children. The man lived mm -hmm. alone, and Henry was similarly lonely after the loss of his daughter. The burglar killed five orphans at the man's home, and William killed five children at the restaurant Henry co-owned. Additionally, the mention of how at night there was a knock at the door could connect to how the scrap animatronics show up in the alleyway during Pizzeria Simulator. You may notice I didn't talk about the part of the story where the man stitched the bodies of the orphans together to put them in one coffin. This is what a lot of people use to connect this story to the theory that the souls of the kids from the missing children's incident were taken from the original animatronics and put into the Funtime animatronics, yeah. which eventually combined and somewhat separated given Scrap Baby's off doing her own thing That's to become Molten Freddy, aka Molten MCI. However, I don't think this portion of the story is meant to prove Molten MCI, and not just because it wouldn't make much sense for Henry to have created Molten Freddy. The missing kid's spirits would have had to end up in the Pizzeria Simulator location somehow, but I think this story is about the souls located at the FNAF 3 location, not Molten Freddy. Freddy, which would be better represented by the knock at the door. Molten Freddy got itself to the location, but without Happiest Day releasing their souls, the kids would still be stuck to the broken parts in the FNAF 3 location. And given Happiest Day involves Charlie's spirit moving on when she's definitely around in Pizzeria Simulator as Lefty, I get the feeling Happiest Day didn't happen at that point in time. I... hmm... I, I, I get what she's saying. I truly get what she's saying, and I think that is the line that stands out to me the most in this... in, in this entire, like, video. Like, the entire three stories is that last line of that night there was a knock at the door what does that mean and you're right to maybe assume it's to do with pizzeria simulator i always personally thought it was to do with ennard right so in the fake ending of sister location you're sat back at home as michael afton watching immortal and the restless and then ennard has come up now to your house into your living room and scraping along the floor and looking at you and then fade to black, right? I think that could be more related uh, here with that night there was a knock at the door. And I don't I don't know. It just seems to fit better, in my opinion, at least. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Of course, it's absolutely understandable if you see things differently. My interpretations aren't definitive or anything. But overall, I think these interpretations are pretty satisfying, with each yeah. story being about one of the characters who acted to fix the problems William created. But hey, if you have any thoughts, feel free to let me know in the comments and I'll check them out. Please consider sharing this video if you enjoyed Yay. it, subscribe to see the future content, don't get stabbed, and have a nice day. Man, ID, you need to you need to upload more. <laughs> you need to upload more. Uh, um, no, quality is is over quantity. Nah, that was that's a really good video. As I say, I, I I've seen that before. Uh, I don't always remember the details of these videos when I watch them. Um, but now that I've rewatched that, yeah, no, it does make sense. Um, because you have a story about Charlie and the missing children. You have a story about Michael and baby elizabeth and then you have a story about henry and um and everything else she talked about <laughs> i'm terrible at talking okay and i feel like those three stories kind of wraps up the st series quite nicely which is what fnaf 6 aimed to do and I, I think that is very key to to solving this as well and and the fact that this store this sorry this game was supposed to kind of show us the 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 past of Freddy's, but also the end of Freddy's, is is very telling, and, and I think this ties up a lot of loose ends. So yeah, thank you so much, ID, for that video. I think that is cool. Let's move on to another video. So I'm going to be watching Rye Toast now, and this is Rye Toast's video on Help Wanted Two. Being a prequel? What? Uh, okay, so that's that's gonna be interesting. Uh, I haven't seen this video yet. Uh, I have I have talked to Raitos in the past. He's a pretty cool dude, uh, and ID is amazing as well. Uh, but what is this? I don't know where he's gonna go with this. We haven't seen that much on Help Wanted Two, so I am excited to see this video. Let's get straight into it. 
So, slices, put on your aprons and let's bake ourselves a theory. First, let's, let's bake. add our ingredients. We'll okay. start by going over everything we know from the Help Wanted 2 teaser that we got on the PlayStation Showcase. Because although that teaser doesn't seem like it gives us much, there's actually a lot to work with. There is also, quite a bit in there, yeah. We'll mix these ingredients later when we start theorizing, but for now, let's just go over everything that seems important from this trailer. The dialogue here, in general, isn't anything super groundbreaking, but there are a few lines that stick out. Welcome back for another week of yeah, fulfillment. That's we know how who are we in this game is, is the big thing. I think it could be Michael, you know. As far as important visuals go, obviously the fact that this is sister location could hold meaning. Not only that, but since this is an exact one-to-one -one replica of the sister location elevator, any mm -hmm. differences are inherently important. They chose to change these things. What did I they guess. Change? Well, they changed. It could just be aesthetic purposes, but. Thing. This Among Us wireboard in the bottom right corner. A bunch of theorists immediately pointed out that it is identical to the one we see in Ruin, at yeah. least in shape and layout. That seems important, we'll mark that down. It's essentially telling us that these games are connected in some way. I know that seems short, but believe me when I say there's a lot here to work with. Also, I'm going to be talking about Ruin for sure, but we've gone over that trailer so much. I'm sure you've seen it. Like, I've made three videos on just the one trailer. But in case you haven't seen the uh. trailer, I will be going over parts of it on a need-to-know basis. My first immediate thought is that we have a time frame for this game. Well, almost. You see, the you did an adequate job the last time and welcome back for another week lines imply that not only have we been here before, we've been here for an entire week and this is happening soon after. Yeah, you're Michael. Oh, jeez. De-edit. For those who don't know, I record the live action and then the green screen bit. So this is the end of all those brushes. <laughs> what, what the? Is that a hair pancake? While this could be implying that okay. this game takes place soon after Help Wanted, I hesitate. Mainly because Help Wanted isn't split up in any way to imply that it takes place over the course of a week. Frankly, we have no idea how long Help Wanted takes as a game. Yeah, However, that's true. Sister Location does take place over a week. This almost makes me feel like this dialogue is specifically talking about returning to Sister Location after the events of the game Sister Location. But that doesn't hold up either because of the Ballora jump scare. Obviously, the events of Sister Location haven't taken place yet because if they had, Ballora would be gone. I mean, she was the first one to begin the entered conglomerate. Okay, that, that is fair enough. I think this is going to be... Ah, oh, this is really difficult, you know. It, it's really hard to speculate about this because, yes, there is a lot in the trailer, but there's also a lot that we don't get. And um, I, I, I really, I think it might be another virtual reality experience, just like in the original Help Wanted. I just don't know where they're going to take it. Like, where in the timeline is this going to be? What can it tell us, I guess, about sister location and... Who are we playing as? I, I do think that you are right in saying, you know, you're back for another week. That must mean it's Michael. I, I, and I don't think, I, I think the Ballora thing might be an indication or an indicator that um, that this is another virtual reality experience. And it, hmm... It's very tricky. It's I don't know. I feel like this jump scare is a solid confirmation that this iteration of the sister location bunker is specific to Help Wanted 2, not actually going to the sister location bunker. Yes. But going yes. back to if these voice lines are talking about Help Wanted 2, it does make a little more sense. You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet backs up Help Wanted 2. Because if we're talking about sister location, the only one who's been there for a full week we know of is Michael. And he's seen everything. Yeah. In fact, he's probably seen too much. Really? <laughs> at this point, the only thing that Michael Afton hasn't seen is roughly 76.5% of my viewers pressing the subscribe uh. So if we're just talking about another VR game, how does that affect the lore? If Help Wanted 2 takes place immediately after Help Wanted, it doesn't seem immediately clear why there's any reason for it to exist. Help Wanted to Security Breach is a straight line. Not only that, but we've already covered most of the FNAF games. As far as uncharted territory for a new VR sequel, we realistically just have FNAF 6, Ultimate Custom Night, which is already a collection game, and Security Breach. So 
why or when does this game take place? I think there are two very clear possibilities for the lore of Help Wanted 2. It's deciding which one seems most likely. And I lean towards one, so let's start with the one that I think is less likely. For those who aren't reading any books that are coming out now, first off, you really should. There's some really good lore dumps in there, and if you can't purchase yes, any right location or price, yes. it, one of the important stories we'll be talking about today is GGY. There's a lot of really okay. big lore dumps in this story, but the most important thing for today's theory is that it pretty much confirms Gregory's Gregory patient, patient 46, yes. And was most likely taken over by Glitchtrap in a similar method to Vanessa. So if Gregory was overtaken in a similar way to Vanessa, then a similar game makes a lot of sense. So the first possibility so is that we play Gregory, Gregory is going to be the player in Help Wanted 2, hmm. and we're seeing a sort of prequel to Security Breach where Glitchtrap is slowly I'm taking not over the mind of Gregory. Welcome back for another week. This implies that this is soon after the first Help Wanted, and Help Wanted's last Easter egg has yeah. us putting on the Vanny mask and holding the Glitchtrap plushie to talk to Glitchtrap. We hear Vanessa say, I will be ready and I won't let you down. Then later Later on a Scott Games teaser for Security Breach, she echoes that sentiment. When her and Glitchtrap have the conversation, have you selected one? I have. They were looking for a child to possess right at the end of Help Wanted. So if Help Wanted yeah. 2 takes place immediately after, this lines up with Gregory. But even I don't know. with the evidence we have for this theory, I feel like there's more evidence against this theory. First up, most prominently, a theory by fellow FNAF tuber FNAF, go subscribe to him, he's really cool, suggested that it was actually Glitchtrap using the Balloon World arcade I would agree that with took that. over the mind of Gregory. I would agree. And I think that adds up and makes a lot of sense. Help Wanted 2 feels like it will be a continuation of the story. But if that's that's the case, then what would Help Wanted 2 cover? How would there be enough content to justify its creation, and who would we be playing as? Well, I think I have an answer for that, but we'll have to pop our mixture into the oven to see what kind of horrors uh. I think Help Wanted 2 is being released sequentially in the timeline, because I think this game will be the ultimate fate of our brand new protagonist, Cassie, all thanks to our brand new antagonist, Ooh. The Mimic. Mimic sweep. Mm. For those who don't read the FNAF books for the myriad of valid reasons uh. why not to, the most recent one had a story that gave us more information yeah. on the, the mimic. Villain, I know about the, the mimic. mimic. So this glitch trap virus isn't exactly William's agony taken form, but rather a program tainted by agony that's learned from William and is now being put in the Sparknotes highlights version of every bad thing William and Fazbear has ever done. That's why it just recreates and keeps creating these terrible things. It's just seeing what it knows and recreating it. We can even see the ultimate expression of this in the last level of Help Wanted, Pizza Party. Mimic 1 is literally recreating William taking a kid into the back. Yeah, Pizza Party is very clearly like suit. the Mimic it's game. Doing this using copy it's great. And rehashed versions of environments we've already been yeah. in. This section screams that Glitchtrap is Mimic 1. It just fits so yeah, perfectly. Yeah, it does. And now, because of Help Wanted and Security Breach, we know that Mimic 1 is trying to make human slaves to do something, most likely rematerialize into the real world. In the epilogues of Tales from the Pizzaplex, multiple times now, the Mimic tries to lure teens into a trap so it can kill it by talking over the radio system and pretending to be a child trapped in the Pizzaplex. And what do we get throughout the entire Security Breach Ruin trailer? I'm trapped. I'm trapped. Here at the pizza flex, what's left of it? My exact yeah. same. I made my theory this on this. This even goes back to the original poster where we get this image of Gregory on a digital background yeah. with digital text digital. saying, help me. This is literally a digital recreation of Gregory luring I someone I agree, in. and we see so the same the thing in Prankster. Is, if Cassie is being led into a trap, what's the goal? Why bother capturing this random girl? Well... Help Wanted 2. I think there's going to be an emphasis on more original type games like The Vent Repair. And I like really, that. really Part hope of the so. I think this is because of the huge amount of recreated rooms from Help Wanted in the Security Breach Pizzaplex. Yeah. And was already mimicking levels yeah. from Help Wanted. So why wouldn't it be creating more? Enhancing this digital point. prison of Fazbear. All to create an enhanced mind wiping program. And at the end of it, we'll have one more human slave in Afton's clutches. And if you want to know even more on why I'm so certain that Ruin is a trap and Cassie is going to lose, go ahead and watch that video all about that topic. For now, a huge shout out to the Toasty wow. Slices, the best channel members around. And until next time, as always, stay Toasty Slices. What a great video, man. That was... I, I actually really enjoyed that. I, I think... I think he's, he's on the nose with that at, at that last point. I, I don't think... 
that Gregory is going to be the protagonist. I think that... I don't think it's going to be a prequel. Because all, all of the reasons he said are, are very valid. Like, why would they be doing a prequel when we already know about Gregory being glitch-trapized? glitch glitch trapized. It's a strange verb. Why would we have a prequel kind of, like, so far in the future? Like, if you look at the timeline, the, like, the literal real-life timeline of these games, like, it doesn't really add up that there would be a prequel game that far down. Um, so I, I agree with his points, but the, the, the theory that Cassie is the one behind it, I, I've never even, like, considered that. I haven't considered Cassie being the one, and that's very interesting because I, I have the same belief that Cassie will be trapped and will lose. Um, so that is interesting. I think Steel Wool don't want to do the same thing that they did in Help Wanted. They obviously want new mechanics and new lore and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see what's going to be happening in the DLC and in Help Wanted 2. But that is later on in the year. We'll see if Rytoast was right about that. Um, but before then, before then, until then, whatever. I have one last video that I want to watch and it is by a pretty small theorist actually. So go and subscribe to this person if you haven't uh, subscribed to them already. This is Sire Squawks. Uh, and I've actually, I think I might have watched a video by them before, but I can't quite remember what it would have been. Um, so yeah, I think we should get straight into it. This is a little bit about Cassidy. It's called Cassidy Fandom Erasure, and I am really interested in this because I have a feeling it is about the Fazbear Fright series and how people have been using Andrew now as the one you should not have killed, when I personally at least believe that it's Cassidy. It always has been Cassidy, and uh, like, why is it even being debated anymore? Um, so I, let's have a watch of it because I am very intrigued as to what they are going to say about this. So let's have a look. It is pretty long, so it might be cut down quite a bit. So go and watch the full video in the description. Let's go. All right. So I've rewritten the script dozens and dozens of times. So sorry if this turns out a little bit ranty Bro, or a tiny same. It also doesn't have <laughs> I rewrite scripts a lot. Throat, so we're just going to get into it. Okay, step one, we're going to skip this gender BS debates for Cassidy for a number of reasons. The least of which is that Scott is already pretty inconsistent with genders, with FNAF 2's Mangle being a he of Warren phone guy, but they appear in Ladies' Night. This becomes a running gag moving forward with basically all Mangle variants. Mm -hmm. Charlie's gender has changed from Save Him to Henry's yep. daughter, so that changes. Scott uses the he pronouns for all of the characters, like the puppet yep. and the he, as opposed to Charlie being a daughter, so it shows that Scott, especially in UCN, uses he to refer to these characters as their costume characters over their spirits. This is also kind of a shift the story has in general, with Baby acting a lot more like Circus Baby the character than Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. This is something that we can see in all of the Funtime characters. They act like what you would think these characters yeah. would act like, first and foremost. With it more the emphasis on the influence of the spirits making them more violent and erratic. Not to mention, the casting says to play the voice however the voice actor wanted. Yes. And the final voice used sounds feminine, even more so this than is great. Like Gregory, who is the only this example is great. of a female VA playing a male character in the series. So, like I said, the genderist debate is dumb. We'll get into even more reasons it's dumb later, but I just want to cross it off why I don't think that is the deciding factor for analyzing Cassidy's character or how it will be used. Okay, okay, I'm going to stop it right there. Because that was, like, two minutes of, like, spark notes on why the gender debate is dumb. Because it, like, I think even in that post about the voice acting, it said that the gender shouldn't be immediately clear. And I know that, that Scott uses he, him pronouns, but I don't think that that's a big deal. I don't, I really don't. For me, at least, like... That's the only reason why I don't think Cassidy could be um, the one you should not have killed. I think Andrew, on the other hand, has a lot more reasons why he shouldn't be the one you should not have killed. And I've been wanting to make a video on this for a very long time. But unfortunately, I haven't had the strength to do it. And I've seen, I've seen plenty of other videos about it. I mean... If you want to have a, a really good video on, on Andrew's side, I know that Ghost, she has a very good video on it. Um, so go and watch that. But no, I, I, I do think 
that it has to be Cassidy. I, I just think simplest explanation kind of overrules here, but I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let's check off what we do know about Cassidy. They are definitely a character in the game's universe. And 100%. at least they have one confirmed appearance in the survival logbook as a spirit or entity writing things in faded yeah. text. And however tempting it may be, we know the Survivalized trilogy is extremely up to scrutinization because characters like Henry are almost there in name and general role only. In fact, you could argue the Henry in the novels is almost the direct opposite of the Henry's from the game, given the Henry's from the games was like, oh, I can't go down until I've taken down William <laughs> and destroyed all of his history in this dark past. And the book Henry just kind of killed himself the first chance he got with yeah. what he had done. Yeah. And William has a lot of overlap, but game William is far more subdued in personality, at least when he's talking to other people in a professional setting whereas book william is a lot more openly flamboyant yeah. for lack of a better term and a lot <laughs> more expressive than normal william is flamboyant so i'm just really skeptical to use a word for william book as a reference point so after this big finale that seems to explain 90 percent of the story with the remaining mysterious 10 percent we have the survival logbook which releases giving us a name about some mysterious spirit that seems to be unlike yeah and, and the timeline is a very good point more here aware, unlike the regular folder. because also phasma frights was like two years later charlie so they're not hers this fifth unique spirit is special to this puzzle in a bonus activity guide that level of bs feels like it's oozing and screaming to be golden freddy and with ucn coming out as what was supposed to be part of pizzeria simulator ending on the note of golden freddy twitching and vanishing into the distance and the prior activity guide bonus book that gives us the name cassidy feels like it should be a slam dunk but this is where the gender debate was born. Because while yeah. Cassidy in the books mm. is definitely a girl, the one you should not have killed is referred to as he by Wither Chica and Mangle. And Wither Chica, I'd actually argue, despite how she's been used in arguments and talking about lore and theories, is way more up to conjecture and speculation. So firstly, let's explain why this line would be important regardless. Because you could argue, why is this line here if they didn't see the actual kid? Well, simply put, not a lot of the cast variants would actually meet Golden Freddy ever. Golden Freddy only appears in FNAFs 2 and 1 towards normal people, or some point where the animatronics could physically see them. So seeing Golden Freddy the costume is just as a unique trait to this Withered Chica as it would be towards Withered Chica's spirit seeing the physical kid that possesses Golden Freddy. And to explain why she, I think she's actually talked about the costume, think about what that line actually means. I was the first, I have seen everything. I have seen everything, huh? Last I checked, dead children can't see things. So if she was the first murdered, that doesn't mean anything. You know what? We're on the same page here. We are on the same wavelength, right? I have always said this. I was the first. I have seen everything. That doesn't necessarily mean she was killed first, which, you know, she wasn't. I know it's like, I guess cliche, but like, when you're dead, you can't see things. When you're brought back to life, you see things. So like, I was the first, I have seen everything. She was given gifts and given life first, and then she could see everything. The only thing I will say is like, yes, it could refer to Golden Freddy, the suit Golden Freddy, but it does say the one you should not have killed. And like, William didn't kill Golden Freddy. William killed Cassidy, or William killed Andrew. So, like, that is that is another struggle point, is, like, yes, they could be talking about the suit, but then William didn't kill the suit. So when she says, I was the first, she can't be talking about death order. Because when she's killed, she isn't just immediately possessing Chica. We see that the puppet has to float around to give gifts. And what did I say? It is the what did I say? That causes them to be alive. You could argue whether the puppet's done <laughs> or not, but that's not important. The point is that the puppet's actions that allows Chica to and see, that yes. of the MCI to come to life. So unless the puppet is giving life to the kids as William is killing them in order. Also, I feel like with the like, Chica yeah, sure, is an fine. unreliable narrator. Around. If you think about it, because it's coming from with the Chica herself. She doesn't know if she was the first. <laughs> like, it, it goes back to what we were saying in ID fan in ID's video, uh, in the ID's fantasy video, sorry. Um, and that is, like, what was Scott intending with this? And I do think he was intending Cassidy. I really, really do. What was Scott intending with these lines? Maybe it's difficult because, yeah... This is Scott trying to tell us that Chica was the first at something. 
So I don't know. It's it's it is a gray area. Two years after UCN, we get the introduction of Andrew, and one yeah. book after the introduction of Andrew, we get Man in Room Twelve Eighty. A story that so it all comes down under UCN, is Fazbear Fright canon for a victim who, in terms of like the same continuity is an identical match to Andrew, and often just the Citrite story itself. Yeah, with how Andrew describes his history and his past leading up to him being in Fetch. But by now in 2023, we have another angle to look at this from. Or at least the community has formed one, whether it's right or wrong. And that is Stitch Line. The premise that the Stitch Strike Stingers, and all stories that cameo or play a role in these stingers, are in the game's continuity. For stitch Line time, games, technically, because the Stitch Line is just the Stitch Race timeline. About but yeah, saying that the stories I know what you mean. Directly connected to the games. But once again, this is a little subject to conjecture. Yeah. It's connected, there's even stuff like what we found, yeah. where it's very similar to FNAF 3. But it's a little bit of... literally how yeah. FNAF 3 in the game continuity happened. To me, though, the real legs for Stitch Line come from when Tales from the Peace Plex open oh, up here we go. very heavily implies it's Eleanor. It's Eleanor, yeah. Stitch Line. And the Tales books are oh, I have a headache already. set in the world of the latest <laughs> games and have a lot of overlap and some differences between the current security breach era of the story and its own meta narrative and even though it's initial it's the argument that if tales is here, canon then fright has to be they want to be so i'm just going to omit them for this sake I, I don't know if i can say their name or not contacted the trade publicity of scholastic about whether this descriptor was still applicable as it wasn't listed on the books anymore they insist they were but they did it in that same slightly off way that the original description yeah. had in the first place <laughs> set in the world of yeah. the latest games i would say take it with a grain yeah of don't salt don't rely on it a lot of the stuff isn't coming from the horse's mouth it's weird slight workarounds to getting it and, and i think that's that's something that fnaf fans in general kind of need to need to learn and fully understand it is that Scott Cawthon is the storyteller. Scott Cawthon is the one in charge, and Scott Cawthon is here to tell a story. And, like, when it gets so convoluted that these books are now in the games, and now there's, like, a lot of overlap and parallels and stuff like that, like, it gets to the point where... Why? Where is the story gone? Like, what? why has Scott made this? Uh, and, and Scott has made this because... He's trying to tell a story. If Fright says in the game universe, that means Andrew is the spirit in Man in Room 1280, which should be used here. But Cassidy also has to be part of Ultimate Custom Night. I don't think that's without merit. Because of Princess Yet, Quest. Despite the evidence used, and the actual chances might just be canon, I can't shake what this would mean for yeah. the character of Cassidy. Cassidy, since they first appeared, this is a good way to view it. presented as a code to decipher. The thing that implies that there was some big important role for Cassidy to play is that yeah, unused Yeah, exactly. We are on the same wavelength, man. The Cassidy screenplay. This one isn't given the label, oh, it's in name only, or that it isn't accurate, yeah. like several of the Silver Eyes or Cassidy other is like important, Swan, man. is labeled as being very important involved in the games, to the point where you would have to be a super fan to Please mention Princess Quest in this. It. Please. And then it acts as almost like this complicated encyclopedia for the game's continuity, then it does try to be its own movie. It was too saturated. Too many characters and plot lines from too many games represented in one film. And yet if you take away UCN, they're kind of just a ghost. Maybe they're part of Golden Freddy, maybe they had a hand in UCN, if you want to argue that, or that's your theory. What do they really do? Even giving them Princess Quest, which I heavily oh, disagree with come on, man. in prior video. <laughs> Not on the same wavelength either. Uh, no. Kind of just that there's some random ass ghost who gets stuck in an arcade machine if they aren't the vengeful spirit. They're just there yeah. for the sake of being No, yeah, I, I agree with that. That's not a character who takes multiple games and a movie script to analyze. And, and we have to remember that, like, getting the name Cassidy in the survival logbook was a huge deal. Right? It was like, <laughs> we we got a reward for doing that. Like, somebody looked into it for hours upon hours, probably, got the idea that the, um, that the name was in the word search, found the name Cassidy, and it blew up, right? Now it is widely accepted that the fifth victim of the missing children incident is named Cassidy. And that is a massive deal. That is so big. We got our reward for for solving that, and the reward is that Cassidy is in Golden Freddy, but that like that's only half of it. I feel like like why else is Cassidy important? Why else would this name be so important? Uh, and also Andrew 
Andrew's like one defining feature about him is he has curly hair and Cassidy, the name Cassidy means curly hair. So like, I feel like there's a big parallel there. Anyway, I, I don't like talking about this very much because I know it's very controversial and I know I'm going to get hated in the comments. So uh, let's just continue and pretend I didn't say anything. It's not a mystery to be solved by obscuring that gravestone and giving this activity book. It's the answer the whole time we're on the same page. Kid <laughs> never shown or named in any of the prior games or plot points, yeah. and that only by reading the fourth and fifth and onward books in the short story collection series can you ever figure out the answer to this final epilogue game. Uh, final with quotations. Yeah, I just can't buy that Scott, who has on the record said he doesn't like retcon, said. Hey, you guys need help solving the lore? Yeah, Scott, what's this Avenger <laughs> character? Are they Cassidy or the Bite Victim? They're Andrew! And what's weird is, because most of the rest of the cast have certain concrete events and roles where you have to find ways to fit their plot and lore into their character yep. arcs, Cassidy seems to be immune to this in the fandom of a zeitgeist. And once again, Scott's never clarified that we're using them wrong, which leads me to imply uh, that I think I can go both ways. Is correct that these events aren't literally happening. There are tons of arguments and debates on how you could fit these pieces together. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like there is an objective answer we can make right now. And to be honest, Definitely not. I think Fright's not literally being in the game universe makes it far more important than if it was. As part of the game story, random continuation that cycles back to where the plot already was. At the end of Pizza Razor Letter, William is dead. And That's a good way free. to think about UCN it. UCN adds that there's a new spirit that is tormenting William. All that Frights does is make it go back to Pizzeria and later where all the spirits are freed and William's dead. Because Andrew it doesn't really progress anything and give us Making answers. a giant book series just to circle back to the status yeah. quo that Pizzeria and Winter set up. And it makes characters like Jake borderline pointless. Because while he is really important to the plot of Stitch Line, he has no effect on any prior lore. He is just the janitor. Or future, really. Or not future, but present. Our only insight to the bite victim and or Charlie's That's a great because point. So many of the Jake doesn't have are any, very similar to any hold on it any of the like lore. It's a tease of what the characters in the main line could have been. We don't get any Michael development. We don't get any Henry development. We don't get any bite victim development. We don't get any MCI development yeah, other than the but one if they're Susie not canon, story. we do, me, that's I think. disappointing. Because of Paolo. If Stitch Line is canon, then it's just not that important it's the confirmation of the date of the mci that's a great a way to, to articulate it because now there's a six skid to worry about it, but i'll get into that later andrew in the first birth rights has to be connected to golden freddy in some way at some point because of the new kid and so if andrew and cassidy are to coexist then that would mean those two souls are in golden freddy Where's the bite victim? The bite victim is now irrelevant. So would the bite victim also have to be in Golden Freddy? Are there three souls in Golden Freddy? That seems a bit too much. It's trying to fit a square into a circular hole. I think Frights is almost like the short story compendium of the plot of FNAF in general. Like I said, an adaptation. Not in the way that Silver Eyes is, but more in the way that a movie is. That's a good... Everything that could be kept or needed to be kept good would point. be kept. So things like the Pizza Recently or Fire, the MCI, the general concept of William being Springtrap, and how he uses the Spring Bonnie character, mm -hmm. even things like FNAF 3, have to happen to some extent. But if It's an like, anthology series remain, showing the lore of the previous games, definitely. Lighting a way to condense everything down to one storyline, rather than a bunch of fragmented pieces we have to put together. Even then, it's still kind of fragmented because of the short story format. And I think the purpose of Fazbear Frights and Tales from the Pizza Plex are movie. very different. Why make this new special extra vengeful kid have an alligator mask? I know I've seen theories of how this would work, but it never really feels like a compelling argument. Why not give him Shadow Freddy's mask? Or yeah. Just something that makes it clear he was part of this prior story. Yeah. Shadow Freddy, as weird as that would be, with the, especially with the nightmare connections that they potentially have, would work as he leads the other spirits to William, which would imply that he is leading the charge for revenge against William. Exactly. Let's move on, but we never see Shadow Freddy exactly. one, which would explain that. This and look right there, there are five kids. No one knew about. This Not six. This connections to Golden Freddy, since they are basically a palette swap of one other sign. See if it, and this isn't even like Security Breach with the Mimic. There are deliberate clues that feel exactly impossible without the Mimic implications yeah. or concept. That's the whole reason we got Greatbot. 
was people reaching to find some explanation. There's nothing in the games to say Andrew possible. is in the games. And I'm Tales so sorry. Releases a month after There's Spirit, a lot more than to say the mimic is. Years later, which shows from the start these things were planned to be connected. Whereas you have no way of knowing, oh, there's going to be a book series two years later that will basically be our Bible of how to solve yeah. the lore. Like I said, this is an incoherent, impossible to follow mess. I'm very sorry. That's kind of casting in a nutshell. I think Frights just makes the most sense and is the most useful as an extremely close version of oh, the game. Oh, that's Newly, such a good way to put it. To fit its format. And I honestly think that might be what Tails is. This is especially because Tails seems to be avoiding using Vanny, despite the fact that she should exist from book one. In fact, prior to book one, because she works in the VR situation. And that all happens. I disagree with that, but built. I agree with the full. She's almost yeah. completely absent in the six tales books so far. To actually give a very quick summary of my thoughts on Cassidy, I just think they're the ventral spirit. It feels most satisfying. It doesn't require. It does feel most satisfying to me. Of oh, and then there's a retcon to the MCI, and that retcon includes Andrew, who's the actual vengeful spirit, and then maybe Cassie's like partaking in the UCN version of it. But actually, by it the doesn't. Time it's Andrew, not a story at that point. Out, Andrew is completely on his own, and everyone else is pulled yeah. out. It's Cassie's red bear who drowned in the lake, or whatever, and uh, all that's just such a headache. And it exactly. just requires that Cassie is just some groupie to the goddamn main story. They're just there. They're just following around wherever the plot needs them to be without ever actually doing anything. I think that sucks. And it's really hard for me to believe that this was the intentional plan of Scott this whole yes! time. Oh yeah, Cassidy will be Same page. Same page. enigma in the background. Make a movie about him. <laughs> now you may have noticed that this video about how Cassidy's been basically erased by the fandom in favor of theories and headcanon, some of which may be true, some of which may not be, largely erases Cassidy in the theorizing portion of this in favor of talking about Stitch Slime a lot. That's the joke. Bye. That was a weird ending. <laughs> that was a weird ending. Uh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. That was an amazing video. And I, and I really want to see more of, of your videos um, in the future. So let me know in the comments if they have got any other cool videos like that one. I... Yeah, I think that's that video has like articulated something that I've been trying to say for a long time and it is that Cassidy would be erased from the fandom if Andrew were to be the one you should not have killed and that's something like we really really have to consider and I think that this was a great video summarizing at least my points, right? Um because I think, like, I've been trying, as I said, I've been trying to make a video on this for quite a while, but I just, I can't, I can't. It makes me feel sick. <laughs> it makes me feel actually sick. And I, I think the only thing really against this is that 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 gender debate, which is, like, that there, there are explanations for it. And I, I think, um, I think it's completely valid to say, you know, Cassidy uses she, her pronouns. Why is it he, him? I think that's completely valid. What I don't think is as valid is inserting a whole bunch of new characters that would be really unsatisfying to try and fit things into the story that don't need to be fit in like that. But it's really difficult because I know that there are counterpoints to that and counterpoints to a lot of the things that were said in this video. Um, and there's always going to be a counterpoints. Uh, which is unfortunate because we can never come to a solid conclusion. But I think on both sides there are counterpoints. Uh, and that's what makes this so difficult. Anyway, that has been... <laughs> I've been recording for one and a half hours. So I should probably stop and uh, and ponder and should probably reconsider my life choices. Anyway, if you enjoyed the first ever FNAF Theory Review, let me know. And let me know what I can do different, or if you have any other videos that you'd like me to watch um, in the future. I, I, I hope we can do a few of these at least, uh, and see if this series goes anywhere. But yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.